Billionaire philanthropist Ken Langone is a legend on Wall Street and throughout the business community. His new book, entitled I Love Capitalism, an American story chronicles his life and accomplishments from very humble beginnings. It includes the story of how he co-founded Home Depot. And it sounds a warning that capitalism is the world's best hope. But its popularity seems to be on the decline in some circles. That's a big worry. We welcome to the program Ken Langone right now. Ken, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. The book is incredible. I'm so Thank happy you. you wrote this book, Thank you particularly much. at this moment in time. And I want you to tell us the story of why you decided to write this book, because you had been watching Bernie Sanders during the election season. I, I had been encouraged to write a book by some people in the publishing industry in 2014 and 15, and I said, no, that's not me. It's not my thing. And then I was watching in early 16 when the campaign was getting its head of steam up. I noticed there were a lot of young people attracted by Bernie Sanders. And I said, oh, my God, these kids are giving up before they even start. I said, you know, like it or not, nothing's perfect, but capitalism is the way forward. Look at America. Look at what it's done for us as a nation. Look at, look at the prosperity. Yes, do we have problems in America? Income inequality, we've got to address entitlements. Uh, public education is a disaster. But damn it, against everything else out there, capitalism is it. And, and I look at my own life, where I began, what happened to me. This couldn't happen except in America. I, I say to my grandparents, they're both gone, but I say it in the morning, I say, Thank, thank God for coming to America, Grandma and Grandpa. It's true. You know, you know it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're a nation of immigrants. We're lucky. We're lucky that our grandparents did come to America. A and my grandfather... That started off the luck. Exactly. One time I asked my grandfather, had he ever been back to Italy? He said, no. And I, my mom had to interpret for me. And he said, why would I go back? There was nothing there for me. That's why I left. Yeah. Well, it's true because my mother used to speak to her mother on the phone in Italian. Right. She would hang up the phone and speak to us in English. Right. Oh, no, right? no. They wanted you to be American. My grandfather insisted that his children speak to his grandchildren only in English. I regret that now because yeah, I, I, wish, I wish I could speak Italian. That's exactly Now, right. having worked in construction, I learned a few of the bad words, but, the, you know, that's the extent of my language. But he was adamant. And the biggest day of the year for him was Memorial Day when he marched with the Sons of Italy Lodge in Port Washington. They had their caps with the Lodge, John J. Marino Lodge. Oh, my God. And that was the biggest. He was so proud to be an American. Oh, and, and, when, and when World War II came and his son and his grandchildren were in the war, he was frightened, but he was so proud. The Sons of Italy. And you were the Grand Marshal of the Columbus Day Parade a couple uh, years yeah, ago. A few years L ago. Let me ask you, Ken, because yeah. your, your father uh, was a plumber. My dad was a plumber. Your, your mother worked in the school cafeteria. Yep. How did you do it? What was your first break? Can you explain to our audience who, who wants to achieve success and wants to get ahead the, the lessons learned? Let me be crass. I wanted to make money. So at 11 or 12 years old, I'd look and see if I could sell newspapers or deliver newspapers, and I did. And I sold Christmas reeds. I bought them for 75 cents a piece from the greenhouse. And I had two kids that were a little younger than me, and the moment to hold, they each hold a broom handle and put the wreaths on that, and I go from door to door and knock on doors, and I'd say, I'll sell you wreaths for a dollar and a half, and the guys, I'll give you a buck, and I'd say, fine. I made a quarter and half a buck, whatever I could get, I made. Uh, I remember one time I persuaded a Jewish man to put a wreath in every window. He bought eight wreaths from me for all the windows in his front house. <laughs> And, and look, so cute. you know, and I, I, the guy that ran the liquor store in Roslyn, Lenny Altman, lovely man, I made a deal with, he, he hired me for 50 cents a night, twice a week, to take the, gar the boxes that the liquor came in out to where the garbage man picked them up. And I found out you could sell the cardboard, so I went back to him and I said, Lenny, don't pay me anymore. Let me break the boxes and stack them up on your back porch of the store. And then I'll sell them every couple of weeks. That is fantastic. And let me tell you what he did. Yeah. When I was getting ready to go to college, I was walking past the store one day, and he said, hey, come on, I want to see you. He said, I hear you're going to college. I said, yes, I am. He had an envelope with all the dollar bills. He, he put a dollar bill in every week. He said, I hope this helps you in college. He'd, get, he'd put away the buck a week he was paying me wow. that he didn't have to pay me. I mean, right, that look, is a great story. I am anything, Maria, but a self-made man. Anything but. There are a lot of self-made people out there. You're saying that people helped you. Oh, 
people. A lot of hundreds people. and professors. But you professors also work incredibly hard, Ken. Worked my butt off. That's right. So take us to your professional life and okay. what, where, I mean, you were at NYU Business School. Yeah. It began, really, my interest when I was at Bucknell. I used to go to the library and read the Fortune magazine that came in every month. This one, Fortune, was the big size, not like it is yeah. now. I was very curious about business, and I was particularly intrigued by mergers and acquisitions. And I knew I wanted to go to Wall Street. Now, <clears throat> the reality was, back then, and I learned this, was a man by the name of Maurice Hart. He ran a firm called New York Hanseatic. And he called me in when I had an interview. My father-in-law, thank God, my father-in-law got me all these interviews. And uh, Maurice Hart said to me, uh, young man, I want to tell you something. I'll give you the secrets of Wall Street. He said, we've got Jewish firms for Jewish kids. We have wasp firms for wasp kids. The Irish we put on the floor as clerks, and the Italians we put in the back office as clerks. He said, you're better than that. He said, go learn about the business. Go find a job at an institution. I got a job for 82 bucks a week at the Equitable Life in their investment department. I went to NYU at night to get an MBA. Uh, I got called back into the Army in 62. Elaine, we had, my oldest son had been, it was a year and a half, and she was pregnant with our second son, and I said, I'm going to Wall Street. And my father-in-law was really upset. He said, look, these are bad times. He was in Wall Street. He said, these are bad times. I said, no, nope, I got to do it. I got This is the time to go. The crash had just happened. Wow. Right? And I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I ended up talking myself into a job for 150 bucks a week because that's what they were paying secretaries. And I said to the man, he said he couldn't afford to hire me. I said, what do you pay a secretary? He said, I give him 150 a week. I said, pay me that. Well, you can't make it because I don't. By now, I'd gotten a job teaching and then why you at night. And thank God, number one, my wife has been my partner every step of the way. So while I was off slaying dragons, she was cleaning diapers and she was doing all the stuff a mother does with two and eventually three boys. Yep. And all I can tell you is I truly believe I'm the American dream. You're also the American dream for other people because of the way you give back. You and your wife, Elaine, have been giving back even before you had the money that you have today. Right, right. And where does that come from? I mean, is it because you, you were at one place, you got to another place, and you recognize that you have to help those people get a shot? I mean, what you've done for NYU uh, Langone Medical, what you've done for education, what you've done for the arts, I mean, across the board, what Elaine does for animals, the veterinarian hospital. And the Boys Club of New York is Elaine's Boys thing. Club of New York. That's the big thing for Elaine. L Maria, let me say this. My father had nothing. But my father believed that you're only charitable when you sacrifice something yourself to do for others. He really believed that. And I'm known, and Elaine is known for all this money we've given away. We've given up nothing. We've sacrificed nothing. On the other hand, when Elaine, she had a boys club meeting last night, when she goes to a boys club meeting, that's time she could be spending reading a book or she could be playing golf. Same with me. And so I'd rather people reflect on the time I give, because that's a sacrifice, than the money I give. The money's in the abstract. There is nothing, thank God, that Elaine and I need or want that we haven't got. 